Our fourth reading today is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 29. And Jesus said, It is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. And then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of these slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents and saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents and see, I have made five more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things and turn to the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed it over to me two talents and see, I have made two more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one who had received the one talent also came forward and saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And so I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. And here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I didn't scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take that talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And may God speak to us through these verses today. Three workers are suddenly entrusted with managing their boss's money. Boss gives one worker five talents, another two, and the third gets one. Now, it's been estimated, I once read, that a talent today would be worth approximately $300,000. So, the worker with five talents is now in charge of about a million and a half dollars. Now, two of these workers, they put the money to work. They invest. They do some wheeling and dealing. They get involved in business ventures. The third hides his share of the money in a hole in the ground. Now, believe it or not, according to one commentator, that guy would have been the one who was considered the hero of this story. Back in those days, people did bury treasure to keep it safe. I mean, after all, what if you invested it or you made a business deal that failed, went, fell through? What if you let people cheat you out of it? That's all too risky. Better to just hold on to it. So by the conventional wisdom of that day, we're told, the third worker is the one who does the smart and prudent thing. He holds on to the treasure. So he will not waste it or lose it. And he can return it to the boss completely intact. Now the workers who wield and deal, they would have been considered reckless and foolish. Yeah, sure, they did wind up doubling the boss's money, but you know, they could just as easily have lost it. And yet, by the end of the parable, it is the reckless ones who are praised and rewarded, and it's the cautious worker who is condemned as foolish. Even the one talent he so carefully guarded is taken from him. Now, some have seen this parable as an endorsement of the stock market. They say Jesus must be in favor of the stock market and corporate trade. Well, I don't know about that, but I do think Jesus agrees. None of us should be poor, but it's hardly likely he's saying that whoever makes a lot of money is better in God's eyes than someone who does not. Now, other Christians have interpreted this story to promote the so-called prosperity gospel, Prosperity gospel preachers 
are the ones who claim that God wants us all to be rich. So, send in your money, invest in this ministry, God will bless you. Send $10, God will give you 20. Send 50, 100, 1,000, God will double it for you. And you know, go ahead, send that money you need to pay the rent or buy food for your baby. Don't hold back. Just trust that God will reward you. Now, maybe it's just me, but is the gospel of Jesus Christ really a get-rich-quick scheme? Frankly, it seems the only people who prosper from the prosperity gospel are the preachers. Now, let's remember that Jesus here is talking about the kingdom of God. And as far as God's kingdom is concerned, what we do with something like money is only part of the bigger issue of what we do with ourselves, what we do with our lives. And so this parable may be asking us, what are we doing with the treasures God has given us? Treasures of life, love, and faith, our talents and our abilities. Are we out there investing them in God's kingdom, helping that kingdom grow? Or are we hiding them in a hole in the ground where they can't do the kingdom much good? Now, two of these workers took what they had been given and they used it to increase their boss's kingdom. But to do that, they had to go out. They had to get involved. They had to participate in the business of life. But it also meant they had to be willing to take some chances. They had to be aware that, yes, they might fail. Yes, they might make mistakes or do stupid things. But they felt it was worth that risk. Their philosophy seems to be that old saying, nothing ventured, nothing gained. If you don't try, you can't succeed. But the other worker, he wasn't willing to take chances. He might have been afraid of making mistakes, of looking foolish. He might have been afraid of losing what he had. These are understandable emotions. But bottom line, he seemed more concerned with his own security and his standing with the boss than with the boss's kingdom. And so he kept his treasure to himself. He kept himself to himself, away from that world, away from life, where he did not have to become involved or participate. I came across a true story recently. In a small town in Oklahoma, oil was discovered on land that belonged to a church. The congregation suddenly found themselves sitting on a huge treasure. And the very next Sunday, they held a meeting to decide what to do with all that oil money. They voted to pay off all the church debts. They made some building repairs, put some money in the bank, and then divide up the rest among all the members. But then one member jumped up and shouted, I make a motion that we don't take any new members in. And the motion was passed. Their fear was that new people might want to join that congregation and they'd have to share some more of that money with them. They wouldn't get as much. So they voted to close their doors to new members and keep that treasure to themselves. They decided not to share their newfound wealth with others they hid it away where only they could benefit from it out of fear that they themselves might have to make do with less. But you know, when that church closed its doors to new members, they also closed them to people who might want something other than money, people who might be looking for a spiritual community to become part of, people who might be searching for a message of hope in the presence of God. Well, people looking for those things had better look somewhere else because that church was hiding those things away too. And maybe the question then becomes, is a church that turns its back on new people, that does not grow as a spiritual community, that is more concerned with its own comfort and security than with taking the gospel beyond its own doors, is that really still a church? A church of Jesus Christ. Now, we all know that not every church has a financial treasure, but all churches have other treasures. And the warning of Jesus' parable is that we can't hoard those things for ourselves. Life, love, faith, the gospel, these gifts are given to us to be shared, to be used for the kingdom that God is building. 
But the biggest reason that we can't hoard God's treasure seems to be that hoarding them pretty much guarantees they will never grow. They will never increase. And it may even be a way for us to lose those things. Life, love, and faith only grow when we use them, when we invest them in relationships and in service. You know, let's switch metaphors for a moment and think of these things as muscles. And how do you strengthen a muscle? By exercising it. What happens if you don't? The muscle becomes weak and flabby. In fact, if we don't use our muscles enough, they will eventually atrophy and we'll use all use of them. Like the saying goes, use it or lose it. The worker in the story who does not increase his boss's fortune has his one talent taken from him and given to the worker who already has the most. The one who proved that he knows how to put it to good use and is not afraid to try. Now, I don't happen to believe that God takes things away from us, but I do believe we can give them up or let them slip away from us. My friends, if we do not practice love, our ability to experience love can diminish. If we do not let our faith blossom, it won't become any stronger and it could even wither and die. And if we withdraw from life itself, from life at large, our lives can dwindle down to a small, empty existence. But the more we invest those things, the more we put them to work, then the more they grow. And since these are the things God's kingdom is made of, that is how God's kingdom also grows. Now, some years ago, there was a movie called Pay It Forward. Anybody seen that movie? In the movie, there's an elementary school teacher who challenges his students to develop an idea that could change the world. And one little boy comes up with this plan. Do a good deed for three people who really need your help, even if it means self-sacrifice on your part. But the condition is that each of those three people must then find three other people to help, and those three find three more, and so on. So instead of paying the good deed back to the person who did it, everyone pays it forward to strangers. Now, in the movie, this boy actually tries this plan. He manages to change several lives in very significant ways. And he inspires a lot of people. And by the end of the movie, this plan has started to spread across the entire country. But not only do the good deeds help others, they also help to deepen the lives of the people who do the deeds and invest themselves in this sort of life. So what is it that can make a difference in us, that can inspire and encourage us to overcome our fears and our own self-interest or whatever else may be holding us back from being better workers for God's kingdom? And maybe it depends on our image of God. You know, in the parable, the worker who hides the treasure says that he did that because in his mind, The boss is someone to be feared. He fears the boss because he says he thinks the boss is harsh and ruthless. And that makes him insecure. It makes him reluctant to take chances. For him, serving the boss probably seems more like a chore, maybe even a burden. The result is that he ends up with exactly the kind of burden and exactly the kind of boss that he imagined. The boss says to him, you lazy bum, don't let the door hit you on your way out. But the other two workers, they seem to have a different understanding of their boss, a different image that inspires them to be bold and creative, maybe even a little reckless. And it could be they consider serving the boss more of a stimulating challenge that can be rewarding and even joyful. And that's the kind of boss they end up with, the boss who pats them on the back and says, well done, come share my joy with me. Now, I have said many times that our image of God does determine 
the kind of relationship we have with God and how we serve God. So do we see God as this harsh and ruthless God, a vindictive God to be feared? Is serving God just a burdensome chore that we only agree to do out of fear or self-interest? Or do we see God as the one who invites us to share in divine joy? The one who brings us exciting opportunities to participate in challenging service to a divine kingdom. Which of those images of God does Jesus offer us? Does not Jesus promise that God is compassionate and loving, forgiving our mistakes, and eager to help us? A God who hopes we will invest the treasure of ourselves in something wonderful and meaningful, even if it means now and then risking our own comfort and security. A treasure buried in a hole in the ground can't do us or God much good. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. But a treasure invested in God's kingdom can reap many rewards and give us this fuller, more abundant life. It can mean the difference between living fearfully or living boldly. And which of us does not want to hear those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. Come share my joy with me. Amen.